Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to my channel. I am Mama to Wife One. If you don't already know who I am, I am a obviously a mom. I'm a wife. I'm a social media influencer. I'm an editor. I'm an author. I am a lot of different things all at the same time. But if you have tuned into this video, then you know what we are here to talk about. We are here to talk about, discuss, question, vent, get really pissed off at the people from Married at First Sight, season 12, episode cuatro, four. So in this episode, this is the day after everyone has gotten married. So the five couples have gotten married, they had their wedding night together, and the next morning, each person has brunch or breakfast with their now in-law. So they get to have one-on-one -on -one time with their new mother-in-law, father-in-law, sister-in-law, whoever, to get more inside information about the person that they've married, who they've only known for 24 hours. So the episode starts with the couples waking up to each other and saying, oh, good morning, and how did you sleep? And oh, this is great. And most of them are happy when they wake up. You know, most of the footage is them smiling in each other's faces and all that cute stuff. Paige and Chris are a different story. Now, I'm going to save Paige and Chris for last because they are definitely the couple that had the, I don't want to say the juiciest scenes, but had the most infuriating storyline, I guess you could call it. So because it's so much, I took so many notes on this particular couple. We're going to start with a couple that was a little more boring. So Haley and Jacob. I, one of my notes that I wrote is that the editors are trash for the music that they pick for each couple. Whenever they show Haley and Jacob on the scene, the music turns into this like video game type music to kind of increase the awkwardness of the scene. And it's not that, I don't think they're necessarily awkward. I do, okay, they're 10 years apart. Jacob is 10 years older than Haley. I feel like for, at least for me, if I'm just meeting you, and we're together now, we've been married for an entire 24 hours. I feel like a lot of the time for me would be spent getting to know you. And it seems like a lot of their conversations, especially the conversations he's involved in and asking questions, stuff like that, have to do more with like his diet. Oh yeah, I work out a lot, I eat a lot of red meat and you know, I eat red meat every day, like two pounds and I do this. It just seems like really superficial conversation and not saying in normal circumstances, when you're marrying someone, there's not a time clock, right? You're just getting to know them, you're dating, you get married, your intention is to spend the rest of your life with that person. And these people, I'm sure that's their intention as well. But keep in mind, they have a timeline of basically six to eight weeks when they have to decide they want to stay married to this person. So knowing I have this clock over my head, I feel like I would spend that time really getting to know deeper information about the person. And maybe they're having those kinds of conversations, but they're just not on camera. But the way it's set up now, it makes them like all their conversations are just really superficial, really surface level, and it's like, it's just kind of boring. So nothing really happened with them. They both went to their respective in-laws, but I feel like Haley was like, you know, what do I need to know about him, and what can you guys tell me? And his thing was like, when they shot to him, sitting down with her parents, he was like describing his freaking hot tub again. I'm so tired of hearing about this man's hot tub. He's like, yeah, you know, I build like a beach oasis in my backyard. You know, it's like a hot tub and it's a sauna and it's this and it's this. And it's like, that's not, if I'm the mother, I'm like, that ain't what we're here for, boo. I'm here so that you can tell me more about you so I can feel comfortable with the fact that my daughter married a complete stranger. I don't care about your hot tub. Don't care about your sauna. You told me all this at the wedding. I don't need to hear it a second time, Okay. Let me know. Give me some peace of mind so that I'm comfortable with my daughter doing this experiment in the first place. I just thought it was a wasted opportunity, and I just got really frustrated with him as a whole. Clara and Ryan, uh, I guess one of the things that they're trying to set up that could possibly be an issue in the future. Done. You're done? Let me see. Sorry, guys. My daughter just walked in. And you didn't show pasta in your spinach? Okay, you did a good job. You can put it in the trash. Thank you. Can you close my door, please? Thank you. So, yeah. Claire and Ryan, one thing that they're trying to set up to possibly be an issue in the future, and there's one thing I don't remember them mentioning before, that both of Ryan's parents are ministers, and I don't know if he specifically asked the experts for someone who practices organized religion or someone, you know, who 
has a high regard for religion and for religious practices. And Claire is like, well, if she's one of those people, it seems like they got hurt by the church a long time ago. And she's kind of, you know, she's not against God necessarily, but she's against organized religion and against some of the rigid rules that are in place depending on the denomination. So it seems like they're setting it up for that to be an issue that they butt heads over, especially when it comes to children and how they plan to raise their children. So we'll see where that goes. But it was still like, okay, this is fine. One thing he did say to her parents is that his number one priority is to respect his wife because that's what his strong mother instilled in him. And I love that because obviously as a mom, it had me thinking like, okay, am I modeling that for my babies? Am I teaching my daughter to grow up to be someone who should be respected? Am I teaching my son to grow up to know to respect women? I don't know if I'm necessarily doing that, if I'm exhibiting or showing that. I hope that I am. But I like the fact that as a grown person, he's able to say that, you know, my mom instilled this in me and it's very important to me and that is my job. One Another thing I thought was interesting is when he asked her parents, you know, is it something that you can not necessarily warn me of, but it's something I need to know. Her parents... I believe are divorced I think I think they are but one thing that her parents told him is that she never saw us argue and because of that she when she got in relationships later on in life she had to learn how to handle conflict on her own because she never saw her parents have conflict so I mean she never saw them handle conflict and I thought it was just an interesting interesting thing to think about right I feel like there is damage and arguing too much in front of your kids and having them grow up in this household where mommy and dad are either always fighting always yelling or not talking to each other or an environment where they never see them fight because again as children how will they learn how to handle conflict and handle issues if they don't see that mirrored at home so I feel like finding that balance has to be a really delicate dance I don't think I've perfected it at all and I'm pretty sure I fall short when it comes to that. But that's why it's just kind of an interesting thing to think about from a parental standpoint. How are we teaching our children to handle conflict? Am I exhibiting that, okay, you need to talk about these things? And then if I'm having conflict with my husband, is it appropriate to have my children there while we're discussing this particular issue? And I'm thinking it probably depends on the issue. And maybe in the future, we'll have like family meetings and we'll all discuss things together so that they can see the beauty of having a discussion and everyone taking turns and us coming to a, like I guess, a peaceful, you know, middle ground to solve a situation. We haven't had any meetings like that with the entire family, but that conversation had me thinking maybe that's something I should instill in my family. So I just thought that was a really interesting take. And, okay, Brianna and Vincent, they are the cutest couple. I feel like, and I saw this on the honeymoon, so they went to Las Vegas on their honeymoon, that's where all the couples went, and as soon as they landed in Vegas, Vincent found out that his grandmother had had a heart attack. So he's basically standing by to hear from his family if he needs to come home, you know how serious it is, and of course he feels bad because he wants to be on the honeymoon with his wife, but the same token he loves his grandmother and doesn't want to leave her. And I love that there's a scene where he's like talking to Brianna about the whole situation. She's sitting beside him. She gets up and sits on his lap and she's hugging him like, babe, you know, he's calling baby. She's like, Vincent, we're going to get through this. Don't worry about the honeymoon. Like whatever you need, I got you. And that little bit I loved because I feel like it showed me as a viewer that their level of intimacy has gotten so strong in such a short period of time. Because at least for me, it's my personal perspective not just touching a person that you don't know that well, but the intimacy of sitting on somebody's lap like that is a lot. You know, you're extremely close. That person has their hand on your waist or on your butt or on your thigh or whatever. And I just felt like, you know, they haven't had sex at all, but I loved the fact that their emotional intimacy, if it wasn't there, then she wouldn't have been comfortable doing that because she didn't hesitate. She just immediately sat down and was like, you know, we're gonna get through this, I'm right here. And I loved seeing that because it was like you're getting this message with them physically saying things, but you're just able to kind of see them like, oh, okay, they're they're growing together. And I really like seeing that from the two of them. Obviously, it's a sucky situation, but I like the fact that, you know, not that I like the fact they're facing drama necessarily, but obviously in every marriage and every relationship, you face some things that happen, where there's death in the family, loss of a job, lots of different things pop up, and it is important to see how your spouse or your significant other reacts to those situations. 
So I think it's good that something like this happened or he's able to see, okay, how does she handle this? How does she handle my family? How does she handle me when I'm upset or when I'm stressed and I don't know what to do? So definitely hope that his grandmother is okay. Another thing that I thought was interesting is that when she met with his family, they all reiterated that he's an extremely hard worker because he's an entrepreneur. But as a result of that, he is a workaholic sometimes. And it may be difficult to pull him away from his work. And I thought it was interesting because when they got to Vegas and I looked at what he was wearing, his t-shirt and his face mask both had the logo of his company. And she noticed that he also packed his laptop for the honeymoon. So I thought it was interesting. And I guess in the future, we'll see if that becomes a problem if he doesn't know how to pull away. And I feel like it was important for the family to tell her that so she's aware of it. And I'm sure for him, it's going to be a challenge not spending as much time on his job and making sure that he finds that balance between working and solidifying this life for himself and then also being a husband. But I think because he hasn't really had to do that in the past, you know, it's he didn't have to do it. But I feel like I have a wife now. I feel like he's going to want to do it because he has to do it now. So we'll see. And Virginia and Eric. They, I mean, they're kissing a lot. They haven't had sex, which is like, okay. But they're kissing a lot, which is fine. And he told her, and I like, I do like this about Eric. He obviously spent a lot of time with her on the wedding day. So he had plenty of time to tell her that he had been married before and that he's divorced. But I liked that he purposely evaded it. And he was like, you know, we got some things to talk about, but we're not going to talk about it now. I like that he wanted to have their wedding day just be focused on them and on their day and nothing else. I really, really appreciated that. So the next day when they had breakfast, he told her like, hey, just to let you know, I have been married before, but I've been divorced now for three years. And, you know, I didn't have a wedding. I didn't have a ring. So all the things that we did together, I've never done before. So I love the fact that he specified that. Because I feel like if I'm a person, obviously marrying a stranger, and I find out you got, you've got, already been married and you've already been down this road, then it kind of takes it away from me a little bit. Like, oh, I wasn't your first. Like, I experienced this for the first time, but you've already gone through this. So I like the fact that he hasn't gone through that. He hasn't, you know, had the tux and had the bridal party and took the pictures. He's never done that part. So I like the fact that they still got to experience that for the first time together. And I'm hoping that she focused on that part as opposed to the fact that, oh, you have been married before but uh so she's the one also that has abandonment issues and his parents were telling her that well you know as a pilot's wife is a little hard but for the most part he's gone like four days a week but she said oh that's fine i like my space and i was like not saying that she's lying but if you have abandonment issues but you like your space i don't really know how those two things coincide especially if four days a week sounds it is a lot. I'm not going to say it sounds like a lot. It, that's more than half the week. And I feel like in the beginning, she'll be like, oh, okay, this comes to territory. But I don't know how sustainable that is. And maybe she's, you know, maybe she is down for it. Who knows? And I like that, you know, they keep bringing up that she's a party girl. So one comment that Eric made that I appreciated is that he was like, hey, and even her father said, you know, she likes to go out a lot. He was like, keep in mind, I know you're 34. She's not in her 30s. She's 26. And she likes to be with her girlfriends. And she asked him, like, the fact that I party so much, is that going to be a problem for you? And he told her, I don't really party like that, but I feel like I'm not upset that you're still in that phase of partying. Because even though you're still in that phase of partying, you, you still made the decision to be married. So that lets me know that you're not trying to have that lifestyle forever and ever and ever. You still... you. You voluntarily did this. You voluntarily signed up for the experiment so that you can be a wife. So the fact that you want to be a wife lets me know that you are serious about being a wife. So as long as you partying or whatever doesn't interfere with this marriage, I don't really care. Like, that's what you do. That's how you have fun. I won't stop you from doing that. So, again, these things are easy to say. On the second day of marriage, when you haven't experienced any of those things, he has an experience coming home after being gone for four days, and she's out with her girlfriends. And, you know, she hasn't experienced him, you know, being out and then maybe there's a layover. So now instead of being off for four days, he's gone for five days. She hasn't experienced that yet. But I like that they're having these conversations. I still think that they're going to be, I don't know if they'll be okay, but 
And, and she's 50-50 on having kids, and he definitely wants kids. 50-50, though, isn't bad. And also, I had to remind myself that she's still in her 20s. She's 26, so she's probably like, hey, I wanted to be a wife. I'm not opposed to having kids. Maybe not right now. And granted, he's the one that's older. He doesn't have to carry the children. So I think it'll be all right if they wait a little bit. So I wasn't turned off by that. And, I, you know, they were just okay this episode. Paige and Crystal. Y'all, yeah, so... <sighs> let me set the scene. So when they first show Paige, she is in a cute little dress, little jean jacket action, got her hair out. She's in the hotel room by herself. And she's looking pissed off but very calm at the same time and she's like she's like Chris got up about 8 59 o'clock to go downstairs to get us breakfast all he's supposed to be doing is going downstairs to get a couple menus ordering the food whatever she's like it's 10 o'clock and he's still not back yet I'm calling his phone he's not answering so my mind immediately went to he's somewhere having an early drink with his boys and complaining about the fact that he's not attracted to his wife in my head, that's exactly what he's doing right now because he's not with his daggone wife. How dare you do this, blah, 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 blah. So he comes in and he does this thing that my husband does sometimes where you know what you did was not cool. You know that you're not answering my phone calls wasn't cool. You just being gone for hours wasn't cool without even saying what's up to your wife, sending a text or anything. And he'll come home and instead of immediately addressing the situation and say, hey, I'm sorry, let me tell you what happened, he'll come home like nothing happened and then look at me like, why do you have an attitude? Like, you know I have an attitude. And so Chris kind of did the same thing where he came in and he's like, hey, what's up? She's like, hey. And he's like, how you feeling? She's like, I'm not feeling great. He's like, well, why not? It's like, you know why not? You know you were gone for over an hour. Why would you ask a stupid question like that? Now, to her defense, she was very calm. She was like, you know, what's going on? You were gone for so long. She didn't jump to conclusions like I know I would have. So, so I say all this to say, he looks like really upset, looks shaken. So I'm thinking like, dad, he got a phone call, something happened. He's like sitting on the couch away from her. To her credit, she immediately went into wife mode. She sat down beside him, grabbed his hand and said, hey, look at me. She's like, I'm your partner, we're in this together but I can't help you if you don't talk to me. You know, you have me now. And I was like, wow, she's in this. She's like immediately went into, I am your wife. I am here for you. What can I do? Do you want to talk about it? Do you want to call somebody? Like, let me know what's up. And just immediately, just over, overwhelmingly showed him this support and this love, which I was like, look at her. And then this fool basically was like, I was gone so long because I had a panic attack. He basically had a panic attack because he's not physically attracted to his wife. <sighs> now, granted, I do not have panic attacks. I've never had a panic attack before. So I don't want to say that it's impossible to have a panic attack because of something like that. I don't know. And I don't want to diminish whatever he may be going through. How and so ever. However you felt about the way she looks, you already felt that way yesterday when you met her at the altar, when you guys came to the hotel suite, when you guys were dancing for your first dance. You already knew this. So why all of a sudden are you having a panic attack about this particular thing? And are you panicked at the idea that you're tied down to her now for all this time? Like, is that where the panic lies? And so I was confused. And then we find out 30 seconds later. He, they, had sex on their wedding night. Now, granted, that doesn't sound like a big deal at all. It's like, oh, people who get married have sex on their wedding nights all the time, which is true. However, it doesn't always happen on the show because, again, the wedding night is the day that you met your husband or your wife. So you're not always comfortable enough to do that. Some couples are, but most of them are not. They were the only couple this season that had sex on their wedding night. Not only did they have sex on their wedding nights, they had sex the next morning as well. So, of course, her mind is like, first of all, it's the first time that he has admitted to her. Because he's admitted to the cameras and other people. First time he's admitted to her that he's not attracted to her. And it's already blow to the chest. Like, oh my gosh, my husband's not attracted to me. That hurts. 
a lot, especially when she is all in this thing and she is ready and willing to be the kind of wife that God wants her to be. So to get that blow 24 hours of getting married is like, oh my gosh, it's devastating. But then blow number two is she realizes, wait a minute. So you are not attracted to me, which means you weren't attracted to me when you met me. You weren't attracted to me last night. So why did you have sex with me two times? And he didn't explain this to her. But of course, this is running in her head. Like, how do you have sex with someone you're not attracted to? I don't understand. So of course, she's regretting it now. Like, you're my husband. That's why I gave myself to you. But she's regretting doing that, obviously, because his intentions, whatever they were, were not pure like hers was. So... After that conversation, she goes to have brunch with his family. And it's her, it's his slimy dad, who I still don't like. And it's his mother and his aunt. Now, I want to say that the people she needs to talk to, definitely, I don't talk to the three of them ever again, not ever again, but they're not the people that she should have talked to. She should have talked to his grandparents. His grandparents were the only people in his family, his out of his past or his friends, whatever. The grandparents were the only ones I thought made sense. And just had good, positive things to say about marriage and relationships or whatever. His mom and his aunt and his daddy ain't the ones. So she sits down with them. And she's like just talking to them regularly. But obviously what Chris said is still on her mind. So, you know, this is a judgment call. I don't know if this is the best thing to do. I won't say it's the wrong thing to do. But in that moment, she didn't really know what to do. And the whole point of having brunch with her in-laws is to get... A better idea of your spouse and how they tick so that you have an idea you're somewhat prepared when you go back upstairs and you really start this marriage with this person so she told them that she and Chris had, had sex twice and she told them that he said I'm not attracted to you like we're good on paper but physically I'm not attracted is basically what he told her and what she told his daddy his mama and his aunt so in this conversation a few things stood out one, the mom and the aunt immediately came to his defense and immediately were like, well, was he drinking and was this happening and that happening? And again, I'm a mama, so I understand the need to protect your child and to be in disbelief. Like, oh, my child would never say something like that. But on the other hand, I'm a woman. So I feel like I want to believe that in that situation, I'm not going to immediately jump on my son's defense without hearing the whole story. But on the other hand, I do understand as a mom, but I, at, in the moment, with Chris not being my child, I was like, the mom is trash, the aunt is trash, how dare y'all make excuses, blah, blah, And the dad was like, oh, man, really? And when he did his interview, he was like, on one hand, I, you know, my son is a man of integrity. He's a man of honesty. So I'm proud of him for speaking his truth. Okay. Yes, you should be a man of honor and integrity. I get that. And not saying you should have lied to the girl. But the same token, dude, like, there's ways you can say things. There's Delivery is so important when you say anything. And her main thing is if you feel that way, that is fair and valid. You have every right to feel what you feel. But then don't have sex with me if you feel that way. Her mind, that's what doesn't make sense. And even the dad agreed, like, that is kind of like, huh. But the, again, the dad is creepy because he said something like, um, he was like, you're not his type. He was like, I don't know how you can say that. He's like, you're definitely my type. He's like, you know, you're my type for a daughter-in-law. That was the freak you meant. You knew exactly what you were saying. And of course, he's only focusing on her body. And so, wait a minute. Was, oh, and so and this was the other thing that was interesting that I've never seen before. So she told them that, and they basically didn't give her any advice or really help her at all. So it was kind of a moot point. But... Again, something I've never seen before. Normally, again, every person goes to eat with their in-laws. They never show Chris eating with Paige's family. But what happened after she had breakfast with the family, the three of them cornered Chris and was like, hey, this is what she told us. She told us you guys had sex twice. She told us that you told her you weren't attracted to her. She told us this. She told us that. So Chris was basically like, I'm not attracted to her, but I had sex with her hoping to feel a connection hoping to get closer to her. And granted, I know some guys do this. I get it. But to think that that's really the solution after knowing somebody for 24 hours is insane. Like, and also, 
if you want to get close to somebody that you don't know, you're supposed to take the time to get to know them, not immediately get physical. And he basically said, like, I shouldn't have sex with her. I shouldn't have done it. So if you knew that, and I'm sure you felt that regret right after, then why did you have sex the next morning? Even if she initiated, she shouldn't be like, you know, Paige, hold up, I need to talk to you, or I'm dealing with a bunch of feelings, let me figure it out. Something. You could have said no at any time. So I don't buy that, oh, I was trying to do this, but it just didn't work out and I regret it. Not when you did it two times. Once is like, okay, this is my intention and it didn't work out. Let me take a step back. But twice, like, we're not stupid and she's not stupid. And so I was so pissed off with him. The audacity of you. How freaking dare you use that woman's body and like another person said, over-sexualize her, knowing you're not attracted to her or whatever. Like you are attracted to her personality and attracted to her drive and her ambition, but you do not attract to her face. And that's fair. Like you have the right to be attracted or not be attracted to her. That's fine. But the same token, if you want, the attraction grows the longer you're with somebody. It's only been a day. And if you're already attracted to these other elements of her, focus on those elements, focus on getting to know her better. And then once the attraction starts growing, then you can worry about sex. But the fact that he did it right away, I was just so just, I felt so icky and disgusted by him. And then of course they get into an argument because he comes back to the room and he's pissed at her and feeling utterly disrespected because she went and told his parents that he had sex. And I think it was less about like, why are you telling my business and more about, I don't want my parents to see me that way. Mind you, obviously it's a negative way that you're being seen, but you did those things. She didn't lie on you. But I do understand, I kind of understand where he's going with that. I understand a little bit. But I feel like he could have, again, his delivery is just off. But I feel like he could have said it a different way. But I do understand that if you don't normally talk to your parents about that stuff, it is embarrassing. And I feel like she was kind of painted against a wall. Like, I don't really know what to do. And I think she also told his parents, as opposed to telling her homegirls, because I feel like it would have been my first step. But I feel like she didn't immediately tell her homegirls or tell her family because she was like, you know, if I tell them, they're immediately going to be like, yo, you need to get out. You need to leave. Forget him, blah, blah, blah. And she didn't want that. So she went to his parents because she was hoping they could fill her in on something that could give her a reason to stay, I think. But then she made the mistake of admitting that she talked to some of her guy friends about it. Because I think she was just confused. Like, how do you have sex with someone you don't think is cute? I don't understand. So I call my guy friends. And I do understand him being upset about that as well. It's like, no, you know, forget your guy friends. That you married. Like, I'm the priority, blah, blah, blah. And he's right. He's absolutely right. Doesn't take away from the dirt that he did and him, you know, acting the way he did. Wait, I'm doing a video. You have to wait, okay? But I do understand him being upset that she went and talked to some dudes about what he did. So I understood it. But you have to understand if you are a person who your first inclination is normally to hit up your homeboys, your homegirls about whatever's going on. It is hard to turn that off once you're married. Yes, Chris now is supposed to be your best friend and everything. But that's a gradual thing because you guys are strangers. If you've been dating for a while, that she would have already gotten acclimated to turning to him first. But that's something she's still learning. So I gave her a little leeway for that. So apparently they took some time apart, like physically some time apart, and then they came back together and he apologized, she apologized, and she was basically like, look, we're going to have some bumps in the road, but it's all about communication and it's all about delivery. And I did have a, a physical reaction because at one point he was like, I feel like I came across as an a-hole. And immediately I was like, yep, he did. He sure did. There's no doubt about it. That's exactly how it came off. And he also said, like, you know, we've weathered this. It can't get any worse from here. Those are always the famous last words. It can always get worse. Anything could happen. So next week, they just landed in Vegas. So next week's episode will be all about their honeymoon, what, you know, conversations they're still having. I'm sure during the honeymoon, they'll talk about where they live and more about, you know, children and family and all that fun stuff. So. We'll see what happens, guys. But thank you guys for joining me for another edition of the Married at First Sight recap. Episode 12, episode 12, season 12, episode 4. And I will see you guys next week. Peace.